Hi, I'm Sandeep Das, a general cardiologist from UT Southwestern in Dallas, and it's my uh, pleasure today to chat with Dr. Mikhail Kosobrod from Mid-America, and uh, he's going to tell us about the DARE-19 trial. So, Mikhail, could you uh, maybe set the stage for us? Thanks very much, Sandeep. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you as always, and uh, uh, this is about the DARE-19 trial, which we presented as a late-breaking clinical trial at ACC 2021. And the idea behind DARA-19 uh, is that we already know uh, that um, patients who have cardiometabolic risk factors like type 2 diabetes or heart failure or kidney disease, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, hypertension, all of those patients are at higher risk for complications in the setting of COVID-19. So if they contract COVID-19, they're at higher risk of being hospitalized. If they get hospitalized, they're at higher risk for developing uh, more severe disease. Uh, organ failure complications and also at high risk of dying. And uh, we also know that COVID is not just a respiratory illness, it's a systemic illness that could certainly involve the heart and the kidneys and many other organs. And uh, we, of course, uh, even early in the pandemic already knew that um, uh, it's important to try to prevent those organ complications in order to uh, hopefully uh, reduce the risk of uh, organ failure and death in, the, in those patients that are hospitalized with COVID-19. And so we were searching for possible treatments because there was a, very much a lack of efficacious treatments that can do that. And the idea behind DARE-19 is that we knew that SGLT2 inhibitors, sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, can provide heart and kidney protection in patients that have cardiometabolic risk factors, you know, conditions like type 2 diabetes and heart failure, for example. Uh, we know they can provide uh, cardio and protection in those patient populations um, and the more kind of chronic stable conditions, is it also possible that they may provide protection from organ failure and death in an acute situation like COVID-19? And there was also mechanistic data suggesting that some of the pathophysiologic processes that are impaired in the setting of acute illness like COVID-19 also um, may be favorably impacted by SGLT2 inhibitors. So what we decided to do in DARE-19 is essentially to test the hypothesis that dapagliflozin, which is the SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, if given to patients with cardiometabolic risk factors that are in the hospital with COVID-19 can potentially prevent the uh, risk of, or reduce the risk of um, organ failure or death uh, and improve recovery from COVID-19 illness. Before we get into the details, I wanted to give you a chance to shout out some of your, your co-investigators here. It strikes me that this trial the clinicaltrials.gov shows that you set it up in April 2020. And if I can think back to what was going on in April 2020, that was really, you know, within a month of when uh, COVID-19 had been declared a global pandemic. So can you tell us a little bit uh, about what this involved in terms of putting together a clinical trial in the context of a pandemic? Right. So uh, as you well know, Sandeep, uh, this was a very interesting time where, um, you know, the some of the evidence generation standards uh, were perhaps relaxed a bit, if, uh, to put it mildly. And there was a lot of data being uh, out there and being generated that was probably of suboptimal quality. And we decided from the very beginning that if we were to try to test the hypothesis that we need to do it in the right way, we have to create uh, a mechanism through which we can deliver high quality evidence. So in our minds, for a question, novel question like that, it would have to be, you know, kind of a gold standard randomized double blind placebo controlled trial. And, and of course, uh, trying to set something like that up uh, in multiple countries and multiple sites uh, at the time where many institutions were shutting down and research programs were shutting down was an incredible challenge and also getting regulatory approval in various countries to, to actually get the trial underway. Uh, the other piece of this, um, as you may also know, is that uh, some professional groups uh, or expert groups at the time were also kind of issuing statements that if patients get admitted with COVID-19, especially if they have diabetes, for example, um, that SGLT2 inhibitors should be discontinued because there were potential concerns about things like diabetic ketoacidosis or acute kidney injury, um, uh, potentially uh, with SGLT2 inhibitors in that setting. So there were some potential safety concerns as well. So that made it a very interesting and challenging environment to set up a large multi-center international trial in that setting. But despite that, you know, and that huge credit goes to uh, our research team and all of our collaborators uh, on the trial across many, many sites around the world in really championing this idea and trying to prove that it, in fact, is possible uh, to do a high-quality, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial in that environment and do it quickly. We went from, actually, idea generation to first patient in uh, in about 30 days and recruited 
1,250 patients in a trial in seven countries and 95 sites uh, in under nine months. So uh, it was an uh, incredible effort, but I think we've demonstrated that it's doable. It's doable. To, it's possible to produce high quality evidence in the middle of the pandemic, which I think is an important lesson. It's kind of mind blowing. You know, at, at ET Southwestern, they were uh, shutting down research, at least for a while, uh, as a response to try to protect people from getting exposed. And the idea that you guys were taking on a, an ambitious new venture in the context of that is is incredible. But so hat tip. Congratulations uh, to you and your team for that. Um, in terms of the, the choice of the intervention, right? So uh, it probably shocks no one that uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor is, is considered to be as a potential therapy for any disease because it seems to be having a, uh, a phenomenal, the class seems to be having a phenomenal win streak. What specific mechanisms did you think might be active in terms of uh, uh, COVID-19? There is a fair amount of uh, data, both from preclinical studies as well as uh, human trial, uh, human studies, relatively small but mechanistic studies uh, that suggest that uh, some of the key processes that are dysregulated in setting rigid illness, things like inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, vascular damage, oxidative stress <coughs> um, are impaired in the setting of COVID-19. They're chronically impaired in patients with cardiometabolic risk factors, but get even more stress in the setting of illness. And all of those have been shown to be favorably impacted uh, by SGLT2 inhibitors, including dapagliflozin. Um, uh, so, uh, you, you know, and, and, and then there are some other metabolic pathways as well. So there is some evidence suggesting, for example, that uh, respiratory viruses like coronavirus uh, can actually take over the uh, glycolysis and rev up glycolysis uh, to generate energy for their own replication. And uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are probably some of the uh, most effective agents to actually inhibit glycolysis. Uh, uh, oxygen carrying capacity, right? We know that SGLT2 inhibitors increase oxygen carrying capacity. And of course, tissue hypoxia is another major mechanism of uh, cellular and tissue damage uh, in the setting of COVID-19. So there are lots and lots of mechanistic uh, underpinnings actually suggesting that these medications can actually provide benefit. Uh, and of course, we had data from clinical trials in a very similar patient population, but under more chronic, not acute conditions and not with an infectious illness, uh, suggesting that they provide at least cardio and nephro protections that we already know of under those stable circumstances, more stable circumstances, but still in patients with serious conditions like heart failure, diabetes, atherosclerotic, cardiovascular, and kidney disease. Uh, so it was really a combination of clinical trial data we already had, as well as um, you know, mechanistic data from small studies. In terms of the outcomes uh, that you were considering, uh, you know, COVID-19, primarily a respiratory illness, respiratory uh, and all-cause mortality tightly linked, uh, but also uh, significant cardiovascular and kidney complications associated with COVID-19. So one thing that really struck me uh, was uh, the consistency across components of the endpoint. So now people are going to say, well, the top line result was not statistically significant. It's important to to be frank about that. However, I, I wonder to what extent that that was affected by um, changes in mortality over time, as in uh, rates of mortality, rates of complications early in the pandemic or even pre-pandemic, uh, sorry, in April when you were starting the, the trial versus what happened later as you were accruing your events. We um, had the two primary endpoints uh, in, the, in the final version of the protocol. We had two primary endpoints. One was, uh, prevention of organ failure or death. And uh, that was a collection of very hard clinical events. So respiratory failure, things like mechanical intubation, for example, um, uh, cardiovascular events, uh, and those included things like inotropic support or uh, pressure support or unstable ventricular arrhythmia to resuscitate cardiac arrest, uh, kidney events uh, like doubling of serum creatinine or initiation of uh, dialysis, uh, and death from any cause. So these are very hard clinical endpoints. And, you know, when we initially designed the trial, the rate of those types of events was north of 30 percent um, in March and April of 2020. Uh, and the rates of mortality were uh, north of 20 percent or close to 25 percent in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. By August of 2020, uh, the rate of those events have dramatically dropped. And actually for mortality, you know, the rates of mortality and that data well um, um, uh, circulated and well published now. Uh, from New York City and other parts around the country showing the mortality rates went down from about 25% to 5% between April and August of 2020. So 
we were, of course, this was all happening in the middle of our trial, right? Standard of care is rapidly improving. Uh, we don't normally see some cardiovascular outcome or heart failure or kidney trials, right? I mean, those event rates are usually pretty stable for your patient population, whichever patient population you choose. But here, we saw a dramatic drop in event rates. Uh, it was in a very short period of time. And uh, while we continue to be, uh, you know, well-powered for our second uh, dual primary endpoint of recovery, uh, because it's driven mostly by time to hospital discharge, um, for the first primary endpoint, which was organ failure or death, we ended up accruing a much smaller number of events that would ideally be the case to give us, um, you know, uh, sufficient uh, power to detect the treatment effects that we hypothesized was likely to occur. One of the things that, that jumped out was that the, uh, the overall uh, hazard ratio for these uh, uh, major adverse uh, cardiovascular events was uh, around 0.8, uh, but the confidence interval went from 0.6 to about 1.1, so not significant. However, it was consistent across all the various components of the endpoint, uh, and it was really driven by 86 versus 70 total events. So um, that, I, I think, really jumped out at me as a uh, as supportive, at least, of the hypothesis that these drugs are um, certainly not harmful in that population. I wonder if you can comment on um, the practice or the the concern that may be out there among clinicians uh, to not use these drugs among patients who are hemodynamically unstable or sicker. As you pointed out, Sandeep, uh, for our endpoint of uh, uh, prevention of organ failure or death, what we observed was that you know, numerically, there were fewer of those events in the epic closing group uh, versus placebo 70 versus 86 events, as you pointed out. So overall number of events was uh, relatively small, smaller than we uh, were initially anticipating, uh, but uh, directionally favorable to epic closing, not statistically significant. And there was consistency across all components in that regard. So cardiovascular, respiratory, kidney events, and death from the cause. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, those are two important aspects in terms of trial findings is that uh, we did not find uh, a difference uh, in, in the effect of dopamine flows in, on recovery, which was driven predominantly by time to hospital discharge. Uh, and on the safety side of things, um, what we found was that there were actually numerically fewer serious adverse events, including fatal serious adverse events in a dopamine flows group versus a placebo group. Uh, again, typically with safety, we just look at numbers um, and uh, it looked uh, quite favorable uh, overall. Uh, so I think it's for that to close. So I think it's fair to say that explosion was well tolerated and we didn't identify any new safety uh, signals. Uh, so, so altogether, we had two cases of diabetic ketoacidosis in the entire trial. Uh, both were non severe, both occurred in patients treated with epic closing and in patients that had previous type of diabetes. Uh, but the overall, uh, I think, safety picture um, uh, clearly showed that the, the medication is well tolerated in this acutely ill patient population. So I think the lesson in terms of clinical practice is I think it's the best data we've ever had on what happens if you introduce HLT2 inhibitors in patients at a hospital as with a good medical illness, such as COVID-19. And at least in this setting, um, it's, I think, reasonable to say that there doesn't appear to be a huge impetus for discontinuation of this medication in, in this hospitalized setting provided that the patients are monitored, as they should be if they're hospitalized. And I, I think it's valid to point out that um, uh, there's also numerically fewer uh, AKI events. Uh, you know, uh, this is the other, th these drugs have been blockbusters in the heart failure world, but also uh, in the kidney disease world. And uh, uh, really, uh, again, not significant, so we have to say that up front, but, you know, the, the results are, are quite reassuring. I wonder if you could just comment very briefly, specifically, on the question of DKA, because I think that's one thing that sort of turns people off of these drugs a little bit, just the fear of that. We know that there is a, a potential risk, um, and that risk is small um, in patients uh, when uh, this medication is administered in chronic diseases like heart failure, chronic kidney disease, type of diabetes. We know that from large trials that have already been completed, and uh, we know those results. Uh, there was a concern that if you do it in an acute setting, uh, there could be especially COVID-19, which, you know, as you know, there are many case reports of patients with uh, COVID-19 potentially having DKA in the hospital. So there was a concern that there would be uh, potentially this large safety signal with uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. And again, a 1,250 patient trial, 
we have two cases of DKA, and keep in mind that unlike in other trials, we actually here we did active surveillance for DKA, where especially in people with diabetes, we're monitoring acid-base status very, very carefully, and then uh, additional investigation was mandated by the protocol uh, if there was evidence of acid-base imbalance. And despite that active surveillance, we identified two cases of DKA, and both were non-severe, and both resolved uh, short-left discontinuation of study medication. So I think what that means to me is that. If you have patients that have other reasons to be on the stroke to inhibitors, like heart failure or chronic kidney disease or type of diabetes at high risk um, uh, for cardiovascular complications, and these patients are coming into a hospital with COVID-19, and that's what we studied in the trial, um, the drug appears to be well tolerated, and our results don't support routine discontinuation of the stroke to inhibitors uh, in a hospitalized setting because, of, you know, that there weren't any substantial safety signals that we identified with that, you know, you know, in our trial, of course, it wasn't a trial of discontinuation, it was a trial of introducing therapy uh, to those patients. But I think it's reasonable uh, to say that um, the results don't support routine discontinuation of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients that have other reasons to be on them. Yeah, that really, to me, was, was really the key take-home here was just that these drugs are so well tolerated that the uh, the fears of uh, of continuing these drugs in inpatients seems uh, seems misplaced. If you can survive COVID infections and ARDS uh, on these drugs, then you could probably tolerate it um, uh, broadly. Uh, could you comment briefly on the uh, um, the recovery endpoint as well? The recovery endpoint was really uh, driven predominantly by time to hospital discharge. It also incorporated uh, kind of bad outcomes like uh, death or organ failure, but also uh, good outcomes like shorter time to hospital discharge. And uh, again, just like with the primary endpoint of prevention, which I already covered, the organ failure or death endpoint, we saw in this the recovery endpoint, there were numerically fewer death and organ failure events in patients treated with topical closing versus placebo, uh, but it was driven predominantly by the vast majority of patients that actually were discharged and went home without having a bad event. Um, and uh, there was no difference between the groups in time to hospital discharge. So the wind ratio, which is how we assess that endpoint, uh, numerically was uh, in a favorable direction for that closing, but not statistically significant. It was 1.09 uh, with a non-significant p-value and a confidence interval crossing one because there was uh, no measurable effect of that closing on shorter time to hospital discharge. Thanks, Raquel. So what do you think the implications of this study are for clinical practice going forward? To me, the main clinical practice and, uh, uh, impact is, is really the safety uh, aspect, we, we, which you and I just covered, uh, essentially saying, look, you know, just like, uh, you, you know, as you remember the story with ACE inhibitors and ARBs early in the course of the pandemic, there was a scare that, you know, maybe ACE inhibitors and ARBs can potentially do something bad in the setting of COVID-19. Of course, then we did trials and showed that that's not the case. Uh, and in fact, if you have reasons to be on ACE inhibitors or ARBs, like heart failure, uh, for example, or diabetes with kidney disease, you know, you shouldn't be stopping this medication just because somebody um, ended up with uh, COVID-19 or ended up being hospitalized with COVID-19. It's the same story here. Uh, you know, there were concerns about it. We studied it. We did a large trial. Our trial shows that medications are well tolerated. So if you have other reasons to be on them, like heart failure, you know, uh, our results don't support routine discontinuation in the hospital setting uh, because they're well tolerated. So if the patients have reasons to be on these medications, um, the reasons like heart failure was they've shown to reduce the risk of death or hospitalization for heart failure and improve patient health status, for example, you know, then routine discontinuation in the hospital is probably uh, not necessary at this point based on the best data we've had in the population so far with those children doing inhibitors. So that's the main clinical message to me as of right now. I think there are also potential future research implications in terms of what we saw for efficacy endpoints, but from kind of immediate impact on clinical practice, I think that's the main message. So what, what's the next trial you designed for this? Yeah, it's uh, it's a tantalizing concept, right? I mean, we, we I think the trial is hypothesis generating uh, that maybe as JLT2 inhibitors uh, uh, could offer uh, organ protection in acute setting. And again, dapagliflozin is not an antiviral drug. Uh, so if the effect is real, and of course, we didn't prove it beyond reasonable doubt, but if it is, um, is it also possible that maybe there could be some potential benefits in acute illnesses other than COVID-19? I think it's a very interesting hypothesis. We've generated the hypothesis with this trial. I think it's fair to say that we didn't prove it. 
Uh, and so I think if we are to take it in the future, we have to do, um, you know, additional trials in patients with uh, acute illness. And those trials will need to be larger and they probably should concentrate on the types of events uh, that we studied in, in DARA-19. So we'll have to do a lot of additional thinking uh, to try to figure out where to take it next. But I think it's a very interesting hypothesis. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a, a fascinating drug class, a fascinating drug specifically, and and, and just really, uh, um, I'm really optimistic uh, in future directions in this area. Well, thanks very much, Mikhail. I appreciate your time. It's been a fascinating discussion, and uh, thanks for walking us through your study. My pleasure. Great to be with you, Sandeep.